are back to the people. It's Steve Gill. Hey, welcome back in. This is the Steve Gill Show. 800-688-9522. That's 800-688-9522. You can also send your comments via email, steve at gillreport.com. Steve at gillreport.com. And uh, as always, go to the website, gillreport.com. You'll find uh, links to the stories that we are talking about, our Facebook page, Steve Gill Show, and uh, we'll uh, get into more of those stories in uh, in the last part of this half hour. But we're joined on our Newsmakers line by a newsmaker, General Stanley McChrystal, is a former commander of U.S. and coalition forces in Afghanistan. He's got a brand new book out, My Share of the Task, a, a graduate of West Point and a, a longtime leader in the U.S. military. is now back uh, wearing civilian clothes, trying to figure out why nobody's saluting him. General, good to have you back with us. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I guess the transition to civilian life, has that been the hardest thing that you've had to deal with after a, a long career in the military? Well, it was different. I've been uh, in the military for a total of about 38 years, and I've been gone for most of the last decade, and I've been away from my wife and living alone. And I came home and rejoined my wife, and then my son came back from college, graduated, and he brought his fiance, and they brought a cat. <laughs> so there were five of us. The most traumatic thing, probably being the cat in the in the yeah. whole present. Absolutely. With uh, with your crowd, I want to talk first about about Afghanistan and and I mean you were critical in in many ways both both before and now in in your book about you know what is the mission? What are we doing there? And a lot of a lot of folks, Bing West and others, have said, "Look, we're fighting the wrong war there. We're building bridges. We're we're building roads. Uh, we've already won the war. Let's get the heck out of Dodge." What are we doing there? Yeah, I think we need to remind ourselves that we went to Afghanistan really to push al-Qaeda out. That is where the, the attacks had emanated from, and, and that happened. But when we did that, we upended the Taliban government, and we essentially assumed some kind of responsibility for helping the Afghans rebuild a nation. Uh, al-Qaeda is largely out of Afghanistan. I think we've got two real issues here now. The first is to keep al-Qaeda out, or similar groups, by keeping a sovereign and, and stable Afghanistan. But I think the second one is a geostrategic issue. I think stability in that region, not just in Afghanistan, but with nuclear arm Pakistan and whatnot, is in our absolute interest. If Afghanistan were to go back to uh, absolute uh, instability, I think we, the Western world, would find ourselves faced with a real problem again fairly quickly. When when you look at, at what we've accomplished in Afghanistan, a, a buddy of mine, General Bill Caldwell, who I think worked for you training the Afghan, I think he was at the same time doing the training of the Afghan uh, uh, troops and, and forces, he said you know, one of the things that they did is, is kind of upgrade the literacy. Just having a pencil in their pocket meant that they had changed from, from just guys with weapons to trained, or at least better trained, military personnel. Is that enough of a reason to justify what we've done? Well, you know, I think it is. Bill Cole was a classmate of mine from West Point, and we were there together in Afghanistan, and I think he captured it well. You know, if you go back to the time during the Taliban, girls were not allowed in school. Women had very few rights. There was very little economic opportunity. It's not perfect, but there's been a lot of progress in a lot of areas. And I think what Afghans are afraid of now is that loss. And things as simple as literacy, they unlock opportunities for people. And so anything we can do to help them provide a society that does that, I think it's a worthy task. Had a chance to spend some time in the region uh, in Iraq a few times, and and uh, and one of the things that that we were told by commanders, and it's been four or five years ago, is that we would look back on the good old days when we were were dealing with the Taliban and Al Qaeda, because it's now been d- divided into to every little group. You don't have a command structure to use that word, where one guy at the top orders all these terrorist groups to do this, and they just kind of follow line. You've got all these free agents out there, and you've got different places, whether it's Benghazi, whether it's Yemen. The Sudan. I mean, we're we're seeing these same problems everywhere, but without a single command structure where we can follow the line to the to the other bad guys. Will we look back and say, man, it was better when we had one clear enemy rather than all these free agents? That's a really good point, Steve. You know, we look back now at the Cold War and we say we missed the Soviet Union because things were clear, but we don't really miss it because there was a power that could destroy us in minutes uh, if there was a miscalculation. I think we missed the the clarity of thinking that the terrorist threat was one big group under Osama bin Laden pulling all the strings. And even the Taliban themselves are largely fragmented now. So it's frustrating. You don't know who to negotiate with. 
you really don't know how to, to judge their relative strength. But in some ways, it's a good problem to have because they don't have the same synergy that they did. They can't coordinate things like they would if they, in fact, were a, a well-coordinated entity. Obviously, uh, well-publicized removal uh, from the from the command uh, in Afghanistan due to the Rolling Stone article. You know, I, I got to tell you, General, at the time, I you know, again talking to friends like Bill Caldwell and others, I was very frustrated on your behalf. I don't know you, but I'm sitting there reading, and going, "You didn't say anything. You didn't do anything, and yet you got fired." As you look back now, should you have defended yourself on the basis that look, you didn't do anything, and yet you were fired for what you didn't say and what you didn't do? Yeah, a really complex situation. When the article came out, I didn't agree with uh, that the article was fair, but this controversy exploded in the media. And what it did, that controversy threatened the mission. And no person, no one person is more important than the mission. And I thought if I had chosen to fight it then, it would have harmed the, old, the, the forces that were working for me in the mission overall. So I thought it was better not to. You know, there was a subsequent Inspector General report that that uh, came to very different conclusions than that article, but that was some months later. Do you, do you regret now, you know, not maybe, to use the words, going to war over that article? Do you think you could have survived if you'd fought back without damaging the mission, in hindsight? No, I, I, I don't. I regret the outcome overall, but I don't regret my decision. I was a commander, and the simple elegance of command is that you're responsible. Whether uh, you actually cause something or whether it's fair doesn't matter. You accept responsibility. And I think if I hadn't been willing to accept responsibility, I wouldn't have been living up to the values that, that I've always believed were important. It, it really is a double-edged sword when you've got the media. And, and we've had the opportunity to embed a couple of times in Iraq with the troops in places like Baghdad, Fallujah, and others. Um, and you get close. And we were just doing it for a week to 10 days. You You get close to the troops and the commanders you're working with. And part of it is you want the media to have a better understanding of what you're doing and at the same time have folks that you're dealing with that have have some understanding of what they're given access to and the responsibilities that is journalists or media personalities that they have an obligation and a responsibility to, to be fair and to to know what to report or what to say and, and what not the bottom line is it helps us to have people that can share to a broader audience in in those situations but there's also a downside, as you as you sacrificed. Yeah, Steve, you captured it perfectly. It has to be a very mature relationship on both sides. You know, the military can't be trying to message or uh, fool the media, and the media has got to be mature in it as well. And and so, when you become transparent, then both sides have got to accept a fair amount of responsibility for that. In the book, I outline this in a fair amount of detail because it's uh, it's it's pretty difficult balance to maintain. Uh, I thought, however, that transparency was important. I thought that I owed the mothers and fathers of American service men and women over there as, as much uh, visibility into who we were and how we were operating as possible because they were, you know, they, they had a commitment there. They had made an investment with their kids. Yeah, uh, General Petraeus, another guy who really was very capable and found you know a good relation with the media at, at, at multi levels, worked the media in a positive way. Obviously, his scandal uh, has been heavily in the news of late. I, I had a friend, General, point out that if they were going to name a hundred things that might uh, derail General David Petraeus, that would be about a hundred and first on the list. It wouldn't even make the top hundred list. Were you surprised? Were you shocked? Um, anything that uh, that caused that for uh, Dave Petraeus surprised me, obviously. But the key thing is I'd been uh, serving with Dave for so long, and I'd seen what he'd done for the nation, that in my view, the most important thing now is, is time for he and his wife to, to navigate their way ahead in life. We, you've you've started speaking out not just on the issues in Afghanistan. By the way, folks, uh, recommend that you pick up uh, General Stanley McChrystal's book, my share of the task, detailing his his military career, his time in Afghanistan, and kind of where he's heading next. Uh, National Review uh, did a piece talking a little bit about your potential political future. We've seen uh, other military folks move into the political arena. Dwight Eisenhower, some successfully, some less successfully. Uh, John Kerry may be uh, moving up from the Senate to the uh, Secretary of State's position. Is there a political future for Stanley McChrystal? No, I have uh, zero political ambitions. 
and yet you're speaking out on some political issues, not the least of which this week, the uh, the gun issue. Uh, you have said that we don't need to have weapons of war near our schools, which obviously are automatic weapons and, and kind of high-powered weapons. Uh, where I mean, obviously, the Second Amendment issue and and automatic weapons are two distinct issues. You seem to have a, an anti-Second Amendment position based upon the way it's been reported in the media. Yeah, and that may be the way it's reported. Um, I'm not an expert on the Second Amendment. I'm not a a uh, strong gun control uh, advocate or anything. What I am is I'm tired of seeing Americans being killed. I'm tired of seeing things like kids killed. And anything we can do uh, to stop that is a good thing, and particularly things like assault weapons, where I do have some expertise. I have seen five, five, six rounds hit human flesh. I have seen what it does, and I just cannot bring myself to believe that we should allow those in places around Americans where people can be hurt. And, and yet the the idea of the, of the Constitution is to make sure that, that the people are armed to prevent us from being in situations like we saw in Iraq, where a Saddam Hussein has, has all the guns and then he has all the power. Um, I, I'm not going to take on Second Amendment debates because there are so many different uh, interpretations of that. I just... You know, when I see what an assault weapon does, I don't want to want them around my kids in schools and on the streets. Now, when you use the term assault weapon, are you talking about the the automatic weapons of war that your troops had, or the semi-automatic weapons that uh, are a different a different weapon that uh, that are available in an AR-15 or other format? If you take the weapons that I carried through my career in the mid in the M4 carbine, it is an amazing weapon. It is uh, fires a five five six round at three thousand feet per second. It is lethal. It is designed to be that way. Its only purpose is killing people, and that's the kinds of weapons that that I believe don't have a place on the streets. And and I don't think the M4 is available on the streets. I don't. I mean, certainly not the uh, the automatic version. I mean, we've already banned those weapons. I, I think that you know that I mean those semi-automatic weapons as well, the kind that was used at Newtown and whatnot. I'm not going to get in a big gun control debate with you because I just don't believe, and I, I'm going to be very hard to be convinced, that we need to walk the streets of America with assault weapons. Um, you're also supporting uh, Chuck Hagel's nomination. Obviously, that's been another uh, controversy. When you when you look at, at Hagel... Um, and in his views on Israel and other things, again, is he being kind of like you were with the Rolling Stone magazine, misrepresented, or is is it going to be possible to get through the political process without being misrepresented, I guess, with Chuck Hagel? Yeah, Steve, I haven't taken a position on Senator Hagel either way, except to say that I think President Obama must select a defense secretary that he trusts, that the two of them have trust, because they are going to navigate four very difficult years. They're going to have to reduce the defense budget, they're going to deal with a very uncertain world. And so I think, for me, a critical component of that is they've got to have a very strong trust relationship so that they can navigate that. So when uh, U.S. News & World Report says that, that you're backing Hagel, what you, I think, specifically said, if the president trusts him, then I'm going to trust his judgment. You're not necessarily backing Hagel. You're saying the president ought to be able to pick somebody he trusts. That's exactly my point. It's, it's really independent of Senator Hagel. It is... The president better pick someone he trusts, and I, I am inclined to think that the government prob- or the, the Senate probably ought to place great weight in whether the president gets who he needs. You've said that you voted for President Obama in 2008. Was it because you knew President Obama or because you knew John McCain? Um, no, it was. Uh, I didn't. Yeah, I'm just I playing didn't know, with you. I didn't know Senator Obama at the time. <clears throat> but you did know John McCain. Yeah. Uh, which and, I, I, and I've got a great relationship with Senator McCain. When you look at the at the military, a lot of the talk in this fiscal cliff debate was was cutting back and, and paring back what we're spending on the military. How concerned? I know a lot of other military folks are very concerned that that we may be cutting through flesh to bone to to, to deeper. Are, are we are we making reasonable cuts, or, or have we gone too far in terms of what we're trying to do to the military? Yeah, I I think that the cuts that uh, Secretary Gates. Uh, had been navigating through all made sense. And I think responsible military leaders like uh, General Dempsey and whatnot have a way to do that responsibly. I think if you start to talk about sequestration, 
I think that is national irresponsibility. I think, as you know, if you had to cut, it would be something like 9.4% of the defense budget for uh, 2013 would have to be cut. And because you'd have to cut it suddenly, it could be something like $57 billion. But again, as budgets work, there are a lot of parts of the budget you can't affect. You, you can't cut. So suddenly you'd be having to make arbitrary cuts in areas that that would have a devastating effect. And so I think to allow sequestration cuts to uh, to take effect would really be a very, very bad idea. General Stanley McChrystal, author of the new book, My Share of the Task, former U.S. commander of coalition forces and U.S. forces in Afghanistan, now trying to command a cat. You've spent a career herding cats, and now you've just got one to deal with, General. So uh, thanks. We'll let you get back to that. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Steve.